view about kernel documentation. documentation. Good morning. Can you hear me okay? Okay. Um, actually, I'm not going to talk too much about documentation because I figure you're going to be more, more interested in the other stuff. <laughs> but and we've got we're not so much time. Anyway, um, so just a little bit of background. I'm the Linux man pages maintainer. I've been doing that for about uh, a bit more than 10 years now. Uh, in that time, I've done a lot of testing of interfaces, mm, found quite a few bugs, uh, made a few very small kernel patches. Um, I wrote a book. Um, I just look at APIs a lot. The Linux man pages project is the documentation of the user space interfaces that the kernel and glibc present to the world. So especially section two and three pages, but there's also pages in section four devices, file formats. And one of the things I've tried to do over time uh, while I've been with the project is add a lot more overview, overview pages into section seven, stuff that tries to give you the big picture of how things fit together. Um, we passed 1,000 pages uh, with the last release uh, in July. So we've got um, about 2,200 interfaces documented. Uh, it's actually a lot of text by now. So I think if you printed it out, we'd have about 2,500 pages. So there's, there's two things I would like to talk about today, but I'm only going to think, I think have time to talk about one. One is the Man Pages project itself and, and what its current state is. I think I'm going to have to skip that just because what I want to talk about as well is how do we get API design right, um, or, or at least better. So the sort of things I want to talk about there is why is API design difficult? What sort of solutions do we have to make it better? Um, the challenges of actually discovering whether an API has even changed, because sometimes we don't even know that an API has changed. Um, and then the question of, well, once the API has changed, um, or when there's a plan to change an API, how quickly do people find out about that change and feed back about it, about how it might be improved? Uh, and that ties into uh, an idea I think more about these days is, making commit messages better from the point of view of interfaces. Okay, so I'm going to skip. If I have time, I'll come back and talk about man pages, but I'll just skip to talking about API design. So the sort of APIs I'm talking about, these user space APIs um, that the kernel presents to the world, there's a whole lot of different APIs, pseudo file systems, Netlink, um, uh, system calls is, is, is one of the big services. But there's several other surfaces as well. And for the purposes of the few examples that I'll use, I'll mainly stick with system calls. I'm going to take it as presumed that these are all good things that we want in terms of API design. I'm not going to try and debate that. Uh, but you know, there's a whole lot of things I think we assume we want. Bug-free interfaces, simple interfaces. Um, extensible interfaces, uh, interfaces that are maintainable over time, um, uh, adhere to standards, and so on. Um, so I, I'm not going to try and work through all those points. I'm just going to say I, I presume that we agree that this is stuff we want. And then I want to say next, we failed repeatedly on all of those points. And this has been the subject of a couple of past presentations that I've made. I'm going to sort of focus a little less on the failures this time. I'll talk about some examples of failures. But if you want to find out more examples, there's a couple of previous presentations that I've done where you can find out more examples. <clears throat> One of the ways we fail is bugs and interfaces. My motto used to be, and probably still is, if you show me a new interface, I'll show you a bug. Because when it came to documenting a new interface, I almost always try and test the interface. And about 50% of the time when it came to something like a new system call, I could find a bug. Um, it might be a trivial interface bug, or in some cases it might be enough to actually hang the system. And these are in released interfaces that are actually out there in the mainline kernel. Um, so we've had a history of insufficient pre-release testing. Um, Bugs get out there, of course, that's painful for user space because user space programs then need to special case for a particular kernel. You know, am I working on a kernel that has this bug 
If so, I have to do this. Otherwise, I have to do this. Um, so what I neglected to say before I hear is I'm just going to race through, through a few examples of failures. And this is, this is one of them. Um, here's another one I came across recently. I just had to notice this in a file. Um, Alvira was doing some cleanups recently, or recently, a, a couple of years back in, in the kernel, and he called out something for what it is. Okay, we've got at least a half a dozen different clone interfaces in the kernel for different architectures. Um, that's sad. <clears throat> um, another example of a, uh, no, if you like, among my greatest hits of failures is this one. So we've got system calls that look the same, but they don't behave the same. Okay, there's the classic mlock system call, what does creates a, a memory lock. You give it a starting address where you want to place the lock, uh, a length, uh, saying how many, uh, what range you want to lock. And the way those values are treated, starts rounded down to a page boundary, length is rounded up to the page boundary. So if you do something like saying mlock 4000, 6000, then assuming a four kilobyte block size, not a 406 byte block size, um, then you would lock bytes 0 through to 12, uh, through to 12K. Seems reasonable. Then you've got remap file pages. Takes a start, link, start argument and a length argument. Start gets rounded down. Length gets rounded down. So if you t say remap file pages 4,000, 6,000, what byte range do you affect? Guesses? Yeah, zero to four K. Okay, so you know when users look at APIs that look similar, they expect them to do similar things. And when you violate that assumption, you're, you're giving your users a really good way of producing bugs. We've got other kinds of behavioral inconsistencies as well. So there's various system calls that allow you to change attributes of some target process. Things like set priority, which you can use to set the nice value of another process. IO prior set, which is for setting IO priorities. And there's a few others as well. Um, this, this is just one, a few from several, uh, several APIs that do this sort of thing. And, and there are rules. If you're an unprivileged process, then there needs to be some sort of credential match. Because you can't just go and set the priority on any process, for example. So there are rules that say that for the caller, there must be some sort of match between the caller's credentials and the target processor's credentials. UIDs and GIDs in some combination must match. So let, let's make life really interesting for user space. Let's make every interface have a different set of rules. Okay, and I don't know, there might be arguments, for instance, why PR limit has these rather strange rules, but it seems to me almost incomprehensible that the rules, for instance, for set priority and IO prior set are different. It seems no excuse for that. Um, it's sort of a gratuitous behavioral inconsistency. Um, we want our APIs to be maintainable, and there's, there's several aspects to that sort of maintainability. Um, one is, you know, we want our APIs to be extensible. So we want our APIs to have a, a flags argument or some other mechanism that enables you to, to add some feature to the API in, 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 in some way later on without breaking existing, um, uh, existing applications. Um, of course, a lot of system calls didn't have that. So we ended up in this bizarre situation where we've got a whole lot of replacements of existing system calls that are just like the old system calls, except they've got a flags argument so that we could then start extending the interfaces. And you know, some of those are historical system calls, we inherited it, but you know, some of those are stuff we did ourselves, like epol create, which was a purely Linux specific interface. We didn't have a flags argument, so now we have epol create one. Um, Rename at, rename at two, and so on. Um, and then there's a whole bunch of historical interfaces that did have the flags argument, but they don't check the bits to see which bits are valid or not valid. 
In other words, user space could pass in any combination of bits. Some of those bits are meaningful to the kernel, and the kernel acts on them, and the kernel simply ignores others. And then maybe you're a kernel developer, and you want to add a new flag in the future. So you want to make one of those bits that previously had no meaning have some meaning. So then you've got a, 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 a problem, because perhaps you had a user space application that carelessly passed one of those bits. And now that application behavior is perhaps going to change. Um, and there have been cases in, in terms of interface development on Linux where we've had exactly that problem. And then Linux is pushed back to say, well, you can't make this interface change in this way because it breaks user space. So we've had to rework our interfaces or our, our um, modification of interfaces to take account of, of this sort of sloppy non-checking. And of course, the other side of it is user space, because there's no way of checking is a flag valid from the kernel's perspective, the user space has no way of checking with the kernel, you know, do you support this flag or not? Okay, the ideal world is that you pass a flag to the kernel. If the kernel doesn't support it, you get back an e inval error, then you know you're on an old kernel that doesn't support this bit, and you modify your application's behavior uh, accordingly. Um, an another part of maintainability is um, we, we don't do centralized, or sorry, I'll say that, decentralized design very well. And there's, there's a number of examples of this. Um, my favorite is Linux capabilities. Okay, Linux capabilities, the general idea is break the power of root up into small pieces. Um, this, and the idea is that now instead of having set UID root programs, we have programs with capabilities. That program, when it's run, has fewer powers. If it gets compromised, then it's potentially going to be able to do less damage. OK, so we've got 38 capabilities at the moment. And you have kernel developers who are adding a new dangerous feature to the kernel. Do we want to allow um, users to do this? Well, no, only privileged users should do this. So we want to govern this feature by some capability. And then you have a question as a kernel developer. Should I add a new capability to govern my new feature? You want to be quite conservative about doing that because we don't want an explosion of capabilities. Currently, there's only 64 bits. So if everyone chose to use a new capability, uh, we'd run out of bits very quickly. Uh, and the other thing is more bits is more things for systems administrators to think about in terms of setting up their systems. So the, the preferable approach usually is find an existing silo, one of these 38 capabilities that sort of matches your use case, you know, that governs other operations which are like the operation that you do or that you, you, you're implementing. And then you're going to use an existing silo, and the question is, which one? And if you have some clue, you'll go and look at the capabilities man page, and if you don't think about it too much, you'll scan down the list Systems administrators will do this thing. So now we have this situation here. We've got a capability capsys admin. 40% of all capability checks in the kernel are on capsys admin. The game's over. If you've got capsys ad, capsys admin, it's your root. Okay? Uh, you, you've defeated the very purpose of capabilities. <coughs> And I think you know, this, this falls out of this decentralized approach where everyone just comes along and does it for themselves. There's no one who sort of overall looks after this and says, well, you know, you should silo things up in this particular way. Um, C groups version one, go talk to Tajian. Uh, the same sort of problem, decentralized development. Everyone did it for themselves. A whole lot of inconsistency. Uh, of course, we're not the first ones to do this. Maybe we're just the best. Um, there's a long history of getting things like this wrong in terms of Unix APIs. So there's stuff that came from traditional System 5, traditional BSD uh, as well. And th the thing about these sort of, um, well, these, what this shows is that API design is hard. And 
The problem is, usually we can't fix this stuff, because fixing it usually means some sort of ABI change, which breaks user space. And so we end up in a situation where thousands of user space programs live with the problem for decades. Okay. On the previous slide there, there was an example of um, a certain kind of thing to do with BSD Unix domain sockets. It's a bug that's been there for 30 years in terms of API design. Can't fix it. Okay. Uh, and the same thing for a lot of these other bugs. Can't fix it. People have to program around it. It causes pain. <coughs> so we need to get API design right first time. And so what can we do? Uh, <coughs> so I think there's some general things we want to do. We want to make sure APIs are designed well, fit for purpose. We want to prevent regressions, uh, minimize bugs. The resources that we have for doing that, review and testing. Uh, I think mechanical testing, just by the way, has pretty limited application here. Really this requires human beings to think about both of these things. Um, and we need those human beings involved as early as possible because if it happens late and the API is already released, the game's over. So there's some obvious mitigations. Unit tests. Um, we've been rather slow to get on board with this, but we sort of seem to be starting to. We want to prevent behavior regressions, um, you know, the changes in the interface that we didn't even realize happened. Um, or just check that actually the interface even behaves the way we advertised it was going to behave when we initially released it. And there's been a lot of failures on that. And again, I'm not going to go into a lot of examples. Go and see some of my previous presentations. Um, but here's, here's one example. Um, there's a system call that was added a few years ago, receive M message. It's an optimization for uh, sockets-based uh, applications that are receiving datagrams. Instead of the traditional receive message system call, we receive one datagram. Receive M message allows you to get multiple datagrams with a single call. So you're just reducing the number of system calls that you make. <coughs> Towards the end of the implementation of that system call, someone popped up into the discussion and said, we need a timeout on the system call. Because, you know, maybe we're waiting for datagrams, but we don't want to wait forever. And the implementer concern added a timeout. And I presume that the intent of the suggester was that this would be a timeout on the system call as a whole. The way it's actually implemented is the timeout gets tested after the receipt of each datagram. In other words, the timeout doesn't even trigger until you've got one datagram. So it's useless. Um, so no one tested this sort of stuff before release. Uh, no unit tests, obviously. Nowadays, things are a bit better. Historically, the only place to put things, uh, put unit tests, uh, was LTP, Linux Test Project, which, which was good, but it's one of the problems is the tests are out of tree. Uh, they're usually added typically only after APIs are released, and the coverage has always been sort of partial. So it just doesn't really solve the problem of fixing APIs before they go out the gate. Um, now for a couple of years we've had K-self test. The idea is in kernel tests. You can sit down with your kernel, build it, and then run make self test, and it'll run a whole lot of tests. Importantly, there's, there's a, a paid human being that looks after this. Uh, because I think you really do need human beings to look after this to make sure things just keep moving along well. Of course, if you want to test, you need a specification. Um, and I've always, I've always found Andrew really quotable on many things. And this is one of my favorite Andrew quotes. Programming is not just about telling the computer what to do but about telling other people what you expect the computer to do. So when it comes to that receive M message um, timeout bug, um, the problem there is no one wrote a specification. And what I mean by this is, you know, there needs to be some sort of specification about this. I don't care about these details. This is my fantasy of what someone wanted when they suggested we wanted a timeout. No one wrote this sort of specification at the time. 
Okay, uh, and because no one wrote that specification, no one wrote a test, and the timeout argument is simply useless as a result. <coughs> okay, so the obvious stuff. Specifications give you a, a target for the implementer. Um, without a specification, how do we know the difference between what was implemented and what is intended? In other words, how do we tell there's a bug? Um, we can write tests. And importantly, it allows reviewers to actually understand and critique your interface. And potentially, you increase the number of your reviewers. So where do you put your specification? Well, at a minimum in the commit message, I'd say, but be nice to me. Send me a man pages patch. Um, Other things I think we can do in terms of better API design, writing a real application. So my favorite example here, and I don't mean just to get to iNotify, it's just that I looked very closely at iNotify at one point um, and found a lot of things um, problematic. Okay, so for those of you who are not familiar with iNotify, it's a file system notification API. In other words, you can watch a file or watch a directory to see when someone has uh, written to the file or created a file in a directory or renamed a file, all these sorts of things that happen on file systems. So it, it's a good thing because it's, well, first of all, it's much better than its predecessor and also it's much better than the alternative, which is simply read on your directories and stacking directories all the time, polling your file system. But it, it could have been a better thing, okay? and. So the backdrop here is, you know, I, I thought I understood iNotify. I even wrote a chapter in my book about iNotify. Um, and then one day I decided to write a real application using iNotify. When I say real, it wasn't really a real application because it wasn't something that I released and said, here's this application that does something. But it was an application that tried to mirror what, what applications that iNotify actually do, which is to essentially cache inside the application a representation of the state of, of the file system or of a part of the file system. So my application, the idea was that it actually recorded inside the application the, direct, the, sh the shape of the directory tree. Uh, and when the directory tree was changed or a directory was added and removed, my application caught all of those changes and tried to ensure that it maintained an accurate representation. That took me 1,500 lines of C code with a lot of comments. Uh, I, I eventually wrote that up on LWN, and it made me understand that you know, iNotify is a good thing, but it doesn't solve every problem. It still leaves you a lot of work to do. And there are some things that iNotify could have done in terms of API design to make life easier. So, a couple of problems. There are others as well, but just a couple of problems as examples. When you get an event notification on, on iNotify, you don't get a UID or a PID telling you who made the change. Now, this would be nice to know because sometimes it might be you, the monitoring application, that's doing some, doing some change within the file system tree. And you trigger events that you see yourself. And perhaps you want to ignore those events. Well, you have no way of actually distinguishing self-generated events from events generated by some other user. It would be nice if, for example, you know, people would say, well, people might say, well, that's a, uh, an information leak to provide that sort of information. But perhaps we could have restricted it, say, um, privileged programs that use iNotify. They get this information. Um, this, this next point isn't so much a limitation of, of iNotify as such. It's just, I think it's an inevitable feature of the API that directory mon monitoring isn't recursive. If you have a directory you're monitoring, you'll find out event, event, about events for the immediate children of that directory, but not about subdirectories or subdirectories of those subdirectories and so on. If you want to monitor a, a directory tree, you have to create an iNotify watch for every directory in the tree. This is just how it works. And I don't think that, there couldn't really have been a way of solving this problem to make it better. 
but it has implications for, for the next point I want to talk about. One of the nice things that iNotify does is um, when you have a rename event, it generates two events for you, a moved from event and a moved to event. The moved from event happens for the directory from which the file is being renamed, and the moved to event happens for the directory you're moving to. And both events have names of the file. So in other words, when a file is renamed, you can find out what the old name and the new name is. This is nice. But there's a, there's a couple of glitches here that make it less nice. The move from and the moved to events are not guaranteed to be consecutive in the stream of events. And, and the second thing is, perhaps you're moving from a directory you're monitoring to some other directory that isn't in your monitored tree. In that case, you'll only get a moved from event, not a moved to event. So when you've got a moved from event, you don't necessarily know if you're going to get a moved to event. Um, so you've got to do some matching to see, well, maybe there's a matching moved to event, uh, but it's not necessarily the next event, and maybe it's not in the buffer of events I've read so far, it's going to be in the next buffer that I might try and read, if there are any more events. Trying to do the matchup is inevitably racy. Okay, and if you make the wrong decision, in other words, suppose you decide that there was a move from event, but actually there is no move to event, then you're going to treat that as a deletion from your monitored set. And then when actually you do find the moved to event, because it was really there, but you just didn't see it, then you have to recreate your monitoring. If you're monitoring a big tree, it's going to be expensive to recreate all of the um, watches on all of the directories. Life could have been so much simpler for user space if the kernel had just provided this guarantee that if there are matching move from and move to events, they're going to be consecutive. Okay, so my takeaway from this is, you know, you're only going to find out about non-trivial API problems with your interfaces if you write a real-world application. And I, I think, you know, we need to do that for every um, complex interface before we release that interface to user space. Because afterwards, if we find the problems, it's too late. Okay, so another mitigation, obviously, is documentation. There's a number of reasons why I think documentation matters. One is, I think, the simple act of describing what you're doing in text inevitably makes you think harder about what you're doing. And you just see some problems in a new light. Um, but there's other reasons why documentation is good as well. It makes it easier for other people to understand your API, think about it, critique it. It lowers the hurdle for involvement. Um, Potentially, it's going to broaden your audience for involvement as well. Because if you write your documentation well enough, maybe even user space programmers are going to understand it and get involved, perhaps much earlier than they otherwise would. I'm biased, okay? Man pages seem like a pretty good way of doing things, but you know, it's not the only way. Yes, sorry, question. Uh, where is it? Yes. I, I think one of the ideals is to involve libc developers at some point. Um, but so the, this is one of the problems I'm going to come back to later on, which is the problem of discovery. It's it's hard for people to find out stuff. And all I'm suggesting here is that we want to just provide as many ways of making discovery easier as as we possibly can. Um, so you're obviously, you don't know who your user space audience eventually is. Many people might start using your interface after it's released. But, you know, um, and you, 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 of course you can't find them beforehand, but if you try and make information about your interface as accessible as possible, you increase the chances that random users might find out about it. 
<laughs> yeah. Okay, so th- then there's this problem of discovery. Um, how, do we, how do we discover when a kernel interface is, has, has actually changed? And there's no simple way. And so this is a problem that I face regularly. And one of the things, of course, is I don't have time to track LKML. Um, the best I can do is track Jonathan, who tracks it. Um, uh, so I, I, I resort to things like watching Linux API at vg.kernel.org. You, you know about this mailing list, don't you? If you're writing interface uh, patches that have interface implications for user space, you should be CCing this mailing list because there are lots of people who are interested in this. Um, I do scripting, looking at kernel source trees across versions to find, get some clues about where interface changes have occurred, new system calls, new symbolic constants that might be new features for existing system calls. It's imperfect, but it, it gives me some clues sometimes. I resort to following what Jonathan does, looking at kernel newbies. Um, and sometimes it's just sheer luck. I'm walking through the kernel source and I see something that I never saw before. And I realize it's an interface or an interface change. Um, or I have a random face-to-face conversation. Um, very occasionally, out of the blue, someone sends me a man pages patch for something that was released five kernel releases ago that I never even noticed. And then I discover. And there's a lot of people that are interested in this question of discovery. Okay, obviously user space programmers, C library developers, me, um, tracing tools like S-Trace, testing projects like LDP and Trinity, um, Linux standard space, kernel, kernel newbies, Linux changes page, and so on. So, Please CC that mailing list. Um, and the other thing, of course, is that for these different groups, discovery happens at different rates and different times. Okay, uh, It's likely, for example, that the S-Trace project is going to discover some of this stuff well before user space programmers do. So user space programmers, as a group, I would say, are the most affected by these changes. They're often the last to know. And sometimes discovery is even hard for kernel developers. Okay, as Linus says, the, the most common ABI change, unintended ABI change, we, we change something, we didn't even realize we changed it, and then someone pipes up much later to say, hey, something changed. So we, we get these silent ABI, API change, ABI changes. Um, just a couple of recent examples, you know, back in Linux 3.5, someone <laughs> did various reworking on the message queue interface, just broke the interface in two different places. Okay, one of them was a quite um, painful breakage for certain classes of users. The other one was much more minor. These breakages are described in the man pages. Um, And then back in Linux 2.6.12, there was some reworking that silently changed the um, behavior of the um, F set own F control interface, which enables you to set the ownership of a of a file descriptor for receiving signals when, say, input becomes possible on the file descriptor. It used to be you could target individual threads to say send the signal to a particular thread, and then someone reworked this so that the as an unintended consequence, the signals got targeted to the process as a whole, so potentially to any thread in the process. People only work this out several years later. I think it was two or three years before someone said, hey, this behavior has changed. Of course, by that time, it's too late to revert because maybe there are new applications that depend on the new behavior. And so the solution there was we added another F control operation to give us the old behavior for people who decided they desperately needed us. (coughs) No unit tests, of course. So then we've got the, 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 the problem of the feedback loop. Okay, Typically, once you've released an interface, it's going to be probably six months before user space really sees it. In other words, it goes into a distribution kernel, 
gets released to the wider world. Actually, probably that's a bit shorter, that window nowadays. But it's going to be probably several months at least before users notice the interface and start doing something with it. And in the worst case, it's only then that the bugs are going to be discovered, the API design bugs, and we're going to realize the mistakes we made, and it's too late to fix them. So what we really want to do is get as much feedback as we possibly can before an interface is released. So we want to shorten that feedback loop, get, publicize our API as early and widely as possible. And so there's a whole bunch of things I think you, you, you want to do. Write a specification. Give, some people some, uh, give people some example programs to play with. Um, CC all the relevant mailing lists. Um, Linux API, for example. Talk to interested people like the C library projects, like me, like LTP. <laughs> Uh, various others, and you know, if you're feeling really good, you go and write an article for LWN about your new interface. Um, make Jonathan happy as well. Um, there have been one or two good people who've done all of this. Okay, so then I just want to finish with one more point, really, which is the idea of the perfect kernel commit message. So, perfection's in the eye of the beholder. I have a very particular viewpoint about this. Perfection for me is about documentation and getting APIs right. And there was a patch series that I looked at a few months back, which made me think a bit more about this. Uh, and I got involved with that patch series just in terms of commenting it to try and not, not improve the patch, but to improve the commit message that went along with the patch. So the, the, the first version of this patch, the, the, the summary of the patch was oh, about a half dozen lines there. Now it's to do with um, C group namespaces and, uh, and making um, path names that appear in mount info look right with respect to the C group namespace you're in. I don't want to go into the details too much. The full text of these mails is at the end of the slide deck. I'm not going to walk through it. Um, but the point is that if you, if you look at this commit message, maybe if you're a person who's really in the know about what's going on, perhaps you know one of maybe a half a dozen kernel developers, you might understand what this is about. But if you're an idiot like me, you don't have a clue. Okay, at least not just looking at that, not without spending a lot of time on this. So I think there's value in assuming that you know, people don't have a lot of time, making it easy for them to understand what you're doing. Because they might turn around and help you. Okay, so I had some conversations with the developer, Serge, and um, the next commit message was a bit longer. Okay, there was a short explanation, and then there was a longer explanation, which um, went into quite a bit more detail. My, my, my problem with that is the, the short explanation still wasn't really clear about what is the user space problem that is being solved. And, and the long version sort of went a bit off into the weeds of the details of you know, various interfaces and, and what happens. So then I had some more conversations with Sash. Um, and well, he then turned around and actually used my description of what I thought was going on. And this took me a while to work out, you know, what he was really trying to do. And then he put my description into the um, commit message. And I think my message, my, my text there isn't perfect, but that text is enough to give user space programmers, if they happen to see this text, a clue of what is really going on and what it means for them in terms of user space applications. Um, and so I think you, know, it's, it's, you want to write a commit message that targets not just kernel developers when it comes to interfaces, but targets user space programmers. Because you want to widely publicize your interface as early as possible and as broadly as possible. Maybe then it'll get picked up by a man pages maintainer, or a blog poster, or something, or Jonathan. Um, and then the other thing is, again, Sarge just took this straight from uh, my walkthrough. And I did a walkthrough of what he was trying to do because I wanted to make sure I really understood it. And so the walkthrough consisted of me taking a, an unpatched kernel, demonstrating the problem, and then taking a 
patched kernel and doing the same steps to see what the change was. Okay, and putting all of that into a long message, 94 lines, and then Serge turned around and put that into the commit message. And now anyone who actually take a look, took a look at this commit message, they, they get a really full picture of what's going on. And it actually starts to get really easy for them to try and reproduce what you're doing, perhaps think a bit more about what you're doing, and critique it, make suggestions for improvements. You might say this is overkill. Um, I'd say you're making a lot of people's lives easier, especially mine, but many other people's as well. You're probably making your lives easier as well because you're broadening and deepening your audience. You're going to get more people involved. Okay, everyone complains about not getting enough review, but you know you could make it easier. Yes. I know. Yes. Yes. Um, and you know, sorry, just another. <laughs> I disagree. I disagree. Anyway, <laughs> let, let, let's not go. Let's not go off onto the weeds on that one. Okay, let's leave that fight. <laughs> I, I do disagree, but um. So then, you know, my, my question is, you know, for each patch, who should do this? Now, for this particular patch, it was me. Okay, but that obviously doesn't scale. Um, I can't do that for everyone's patch, but there's one person who almost always has all the requisite knowledge. It's the kernel developer. Okay, you did all the thinking, you hopefully did all the testing, just elaborate it all in text as part of your commit message. And in your commit message, the less knowledge you assume in your audience, the wider that audience is going to be, potentially the more engagement you're going to get. Um, and, you know, don't do this at the end of the patch series, do it at the beginning of the patch series, you know, because you've got that limited feedback window. You want the feedback to start as early as possible. Okay, and, you know, it can be done. So, back in, back in Linux 3.15, Jeff Layton added the feature called OFD locks, which fixed a completely broken POSIX record lock system. I won't go into the, the problems there, but there's a, there's a fatal flaw in POSIX record locks. Jeff Layton fixed it, and he did everything right. You can do it. You know, he wrote a commit message that explained his rationale. He provided some example programs. He wrote an article for LWN. Um, he wrote me a man pages patch. He wrote the glibc maintainers. A, a, uh, a glibc manual patch. He engaged with glibc, wrote commits or wrote um, patches for glibc to add his interfaces. Um, it took them a long time to respond. I think he resubmitted those patches probably something like 10 times, but he just kept going with it. Um, he even started talking to the POSIX folks about getting this interface into the next POSIX standard. Okay, so, you know, this is the gold standard, I would say, of what you want to do. It's not rocket science. Thanks for your time.
Now, I'm certainly not going to disagree. I, 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 I can't, I can't, I can't begin to say. Um, maybe it's one percent. I don't know. It's that sort of vicinity, I would say. But uh, yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Whether we could automate the detection of that. Um, yes, I figured that was going to be your next question. Um, you know, if there was automation, that'd be fabulous. Um, well, I mean, so in terms of the scripting that I do, for instance, to try and roughly detect some of these things, I do things like looking at um, the, the syscall table file. Um, I've got, um, you know, for the various APIs that take flags arguments, all those flags have standard sort of prefixes. So I do grips, you know, do, do diffs of the kernel source tree, you know, did a new symbol with this prefix appear. Uh, I look at differences in the um, uh, slash proc documentation dot text file. Uh, one or two other things as well. It's very clumsy, but it gives me some clues. Of course, if there was something better, that would surely be magnificent. It's a ridiculous situation. <laughs> Simple as that. And there's, uh, like, uh, so the slides I didn't show you, I, you know, I could work full time on man pages. I'm not saying I necessarily want to, but I could. There's that much work. You know, I did last year uh, about 250 commits on the Futex man page to document stuff that was more than five years old. But, you know, because no one else had done it and I never had the time. Um, you know, there's, there's huge backlogs of work, and you know, there's arguably a case for saying we should have a user space API maintainer, and not someone who does it part time, but you know, actually a a warm paid body that does it. Oh. Okay, thank you.